Hey, can you hear me in Zoom? I guess it's fine. The room already hears me, I guess, right? Hello, hello, hello. Testing. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I want to reply. Cool. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our 12th lecture on memory controllers. I'm Atabek. I'm a PhD student in Professor Mutlu's Safari Research Group. And uh, today we'll talk about memory controllers. We'll focus on how complex they are uh, at a high level. And if time permits, we'll go into topics like quality of service uh, in context of uh, multi-core systems and uh, multi-agent systems where we have uh, hardware accelerators, GPUs, Ethernet controllers, all connected in the same system, using sharing the same uh, memory, essentially. Uh, yeah, so let's get started with a high-level overview of controllers. Long latency memories such as flash or DRAM or NVM, not new NVM technology, emerging technology memories have similar characteristics that must be controlled. So all long latency memory essentially has a memory controller associated to it. Um, why? Because if you have a short latency memory, let's say, or some uh, memory device that's, that can, uh, that can service requests really fast, like SRAMs we have in, or L1 caches we have in our processors. There's not much for the controller there to do in terms of request scheduling because it's designed in a way to, um, the, the inputs to that memory device, the requests that come and the, the service rate, uh, meaning that how fast your memory can service those requests, usually is, uh, is very proportional. It's, it's almost the same. So there's not much buffering to do in terms of performance. You don't need to think about how you schedule requests. But in longer latency memories like uh, DRAM or even longer like flash, uh, you have to think about request scheduling, for example. You have to buffer some requests and you have to issue them in an order such that you improve system performance. Uh, system performance is not the only reason why we have controllers. In, uh, large la long latency memories or flash and DRAM. We also have to deal with other maintenance mechanisms, such as in case of DRAM, we have to deal with refresh. Uh, we have to, because charge leaks from DRAM cells, uh, we have to continuously or periodically restore charge back to those cells. And that's done via uh, uh, performing refresh operations. And in flash, we have even more complex maintenance mechanisms, which I'll try to describe in the next few slides. We will focus on DRAM in the rest of this uh, lecture, but you will see that these scheduling and control issues are common across different memory technologies, such as flash memory, uh, other emerging memory technologies like phase change memory, spin transfer, to S STTM RAM. And yeah, these other technologies can also place other demands on the memory controller. So as an example, we look at flash controllers very briefly at a very high level. Uh, these are these controllers, uh, flash controllers are similar to DRAM controllers, but they're much more complex. Um, they're flash memory specific. They're different technology, uh, flash memory technologies, and these have to be specialized to the technology they're working with. And they do much more complex operations like error correction because fundamentally these flash cells are very error prone. Uh, we have to, uh, like out of manufacturing, they come with a ton of errors and we have to, use ECC techniques, error correction techniques to deal with those errors. Um, and there is something called program erase cycles. The flash memory is, has endurance problems. So you cannot update the values in the same flash cell uh, more than hundreds or thousands or 10,000s of time, depending on your flash technology. Uh, I think hundreds of times is a uh, good estimate for the newer, higher density flash chips. And then what happens is the memory controller has to distribute those writes to different locations, different uh, rows in, in your flash chip. So that's called wear leveling. You, you're hoping that all cells will fail at the same time and you won't lose density because you can no longer use one row, for example, because you updated it too frequently and now it's dead. Uh, there are 
So to do this, you also need to perform page remapping. That means you take the physical addresses, for example, coming from your uh, processor system or the rest of your system to flash pages. Now, you have to be able to remap those uh, virtual physical addresses to the flash pages because you want to uh, distribute your writes equally to over, over the overall rows in your flash chip. These are complicated. These require a lot of metadata, and therefore you have a lot of components on a flash chip. You can see here we have the buffer manager um, and ECC engines, and this is a different picture. Uh, this shows a DRAM manager and a DRAM buffers as well. So uh, this is we we in in flash chips we buffer writes. We don't want to issue write requests right as they arrive. So if we buffer some of the write requests in our DRAM chip inside the flash module here, we can service some of the upcoming read requests in case they hit in that uh, DRAM buffer. And we can also uh, we can also perform wire leveling techniques more efficiently. I'll not go into more detail about this, but we will, I think, have lectures on flash chips uh, towards the end of the, the course. And if you if you want to get a head start, per se, for it, it, those lectures, you can take a look at this paper uh, on modern SSD controllers. There are like, other error uh, mechanisms that I didn't describe that this table tries uh, th this table lists. You can see on the different columns and flash memory chips or flash memory controllers have to deal in different ways with all of these error mechanisms as well. That's what makes them more complex. That's one component that makes them more complex. This is a more up-to-date version of this paper. And uh, we have more works from our group that describes SSD controls, modern SSD controllers in, mo in various levels of detail. And I'm going to flash these flash papers here for you. Yeah, that's something I thought of to say. Uh, OK, we also have, uh, I mean, Professor Mutlo delivered lectures on flash memory. You can see them here. And we have a special course on flash memory and SSDs where uh, Mohammed, le uh, which Mohammed leads. And uh, they talk about SSD basics and advanced topics also. And students get to uh, do hands-on, again, hands-on experience with SSD research. OK, now we come back to DRAM. So there are different DRAM types. Uh, there are different DRAM types have different interfaces optimized for specialized purposes. Uh, there's a large list of them here. Now, why do we have this? Because we uh, customize our systems to applications, and uh, we have been doing it more, rec uh, more frequently recently. And when we customize systems, we tend to somehow customize the DRAM uh, to the application as well. That's why we have many different uh, DRAM types with different characteristics, such as in, in mobile systems, like in your cell phones, you likely have LP, low power DDR interface DIMMs, uh, sorry, uh, DRAM chips. Uh, for graphics applications, we have high bandwidth DRAM chips and DRAM standards or interfaces as well. And low latency DRAM uh, is usually used in those um, very high performance network routers, for example, that needs to access a lot of data at very small, uh, at, at very low latencies. Uh, the underlying microarchitecture, the, the subarray architecture, is fundamentally the same across all these different types of DRAM chips. But uh, the, the difference is basically the high level interface and what's outside of the subarray, let's say. And a flexible controller can support various DRAM types if. Uh, if you looked at, for example, the recent Intel, the most I think the most recent generation Intel chips, because the industry, uh, uh, because the market is kind of transitioning from DDR4 to DDR5 to PC market, those CPUs support both DDR4 and DDR5 standard, and this complicates things because we have to uh, these interfaces have different uh, requirements in the way that they. Uh, in the way that the memory controller drives the analog interface. And if you want to support multiple interfaces, your complexity also increases. And it's difficult to usually difficult to support all types at the same time and think 
into the future and support like future interfaces. And you will have to suffer a lot of design cost basically if you want to do that. Uh, there are many more DRAM types. This is from a paper that uh, we wrote in, well, I didn't read it, uh, write it, but it's it's a paper, a uh, remulator paper, the, simulate, the memory system simulator that we use in our group. Um, this lists a bunch of memory standards and some academic research that uh, develops new standards or new interfaces to improve performance and uh, energy efficiency of our chips. And this is a bit old, but yeah, it serves its purpose, I guess. And you've seen the slide before in uh, the memory latency lecture. I think this table describes, uh, this, this table compares recent standards to the DDR3 standards, so I won't cover this too much. And you can find more details in this Remulator paper and the uh, newer version of Remulator that's more modular and extensible. So it's, if you want to use Remulator, it's better to use Remulator 2 because it is easier to develop many different techniques. And I think we will talk about this in a future lecture in much more detail as well. It also implements the newer standards like DDR5 and HPM2 uh, and perhaps 3. I'm, I'm not completely sure. OK. And there's this paper that talks about uh, how, how different sort of workloads perform in different types of DRAM chips. And if you're interested in that, I will refer you to this uh, paper. OK. So far, it's been very, I guess, high level details, but do you have any questions about anything that I covered so far? It's not. OK. OK. So the ARM control logic is large. In this picture, this is a, the AMD Barcelona architecture. You can see that the DRAM interface occupies quite a large chunk of our processor chip. And this is only for one channel. And the newer chips like Apple M1 also has a very large footprint. It's, it's, uh, the DRAM controller has a very large footprint in the chip design. This is another chip, uh, AMD Ryzen, five, I guess 5000 series from 2020. And this is yet another chip. This is from IBM. It has the open memory interface. And basically, if you look at this picture, you see that if you want to increase your memory channels by, let's say, 10 times, it looks impossible. There's not enough area in the edge of the chip to add 10 times more memory channels. So the idea is increase, like this DRAM control logic occupies a significant portion of our uh, processor chips. and scaling them up is difficult or costly. OK, so why is it so costly or why is it so complex? Uh, the first reason is this controller needs to ensure correct operation of DRAM. There are low level signal integrity issues and higher level architectural issues here. So low level integrity issues are basically stemming from the fact that this is one of the highest speed analog interfaces that we have today in our systems, especially um, I, I would say DDR5 is now riding up to seven, eight gigabits per second speeds. And that's, that basically has a lot of signal integrity issues that your analog circuitry has to deal with and makes things more complex. In the architectural level, the memory controller has to periodically refresh DRAM cells to ensure correct operation because DRAM cells will uh, leak charge. And there are a lot of timing parameters. Uh, the amount of time you must wait between uh, consecutive DRAM commands that the memory controller has to obey. It has to service DRAM requests while it obeys these timing parameters. And uh, there are, yeah, as I said, many timing parameters. And one interesting timing parameter is uh, you cannot, because you share the data bus for both reads and writes, you cannot perform a read and write operation at the same time. So the bus needs some time to turn around so that you can, after you read uh, some data, you, for, for you, you need to wait before you uh, can write data back to DRAM chips. That's also another interesting timing parameter. Uh, the controller must translate requests to DRAM command sequences. This means that you have a memory request with a physical address. Now, how do you map, to, map it to uh, your DRAM uh, chips or, or DRAM channels, ranks, banks, rows, and columns? 
it's also easy to over overwhelm the memory system with a lot of requests in our systems today because we have many uh, request injectors, let's say, like the processor or the last level cache, various hardware accelerators, the network, ex uh, the network chips, and the GPUs, for example. And uh, to serve these requests while maintaining some performance guarantees or quality of service guarantees, uh, the memory controller has to buffer these requests, right? And that involves, and buffering and scheduling them involves reordering requests, managing the row buffer, uh, banks, ranks, and the, the write and read bus. Finally, we also have uh, the memory controller also has to deal with power consumption and uh, temperature in DRAM chips. Now, this is especially a problem in 3D stacked memory chips. And for example, in HPM2 uh, and, and also probably 3, we have we have to, uh, the memory controller has to apply heterogeneous refresh rates to different memory channels because these channels are laid out uh, on top of each other. They, we have multiple layers of DRAM uh, dies in an HPM2 chip. Each die has a different temperature and the, the bottommost die is, is, is basically very hot compared to the other ones. And you have to refresh that at a higher frequency whereas you can refresh the other ones at uh, lower frequencies. Uh, the memory controller can turn off or turn on DRAM chips. We will see what this means in more detail in the later slides. There are power modes that the memory controller can control um, in DRAM chips. A very brief overview would be you can, uh, for example, you can tell the DRAM chip to uh, shut everything off except maintain data integrity. That means the DRAM chip will perform refresh operations only and on its own, and it won't accept any of your requests. If you want to bring it back to a state where you can send uh, your requests, you have to pay for a latency penalty. That's the trade-off, basically. This is a very, again, high-level picture of a DRAM controller. So we'll parse this from left to right. We have a bunch of request generators on the left. You have the CPUs and the uh, various different IO hardware, essentially. And they generate requests. And the memory controller has to uh, select which of these requests to issue. And then it will perform some sort of address translation from physical addresses to our DRAM addresses. DRAM addresses mean uh, ranks, banks, rows, and columns, for example. Uh, this, in this picture, the, the memory controller here um, does the scheduling in bank realm. So once it uh, receives a request, it just puts the request into one of the bank queues here. And inside the bank queue, it might apply some sort of scheduling techniques to select which requests to, uh, request to serve first. And there is some low level analog signaling interface. And then you can see that our commands, uh, we send them to the DRAM chips. This is another picture uh, in a multi-core system. This is one of Professor Mutlu's drawings from my, uh, 2007. And we will parse this from top to bottom. So we have, again, multiple uh, request generators coming from the last level caches. And then you have the bank request buffers, as in the previous picture, right? And you, you have the schedulers that uh, select from these request buffers and schedule requests. Uh, these will apply some, uh, some algorithms to select which requests in this buffer to serve first. And we will look at them in the later slides also. Now you see also there is a different path for um, reads and writes to take here. I would look at here. Now, logically, this, is, this makes sense because reads and writes are different operations, but also because we have to um, obey certain timing parameters, the bus turnaround time. We cannot perform a write and a read at the same time. You have to take different paths. And another thing I would like to mention here is write requests are us usually easier to tolerate. That means uh, sorry, write latency is easier, easier to tolerate in, in our systems because we have a lot of buffers in our processes and various levels in the memory hierarchy um, to deal with those requests that likely don't have any um, dependent instructions on it. When once you store something, it's very likely that you won't read it back again immediately. So a store request, you can delay them more than read requests, and you will have a uh, you will have less effect, less impact on latency and performance in general. So what the memory controller does is it buffers these write requests. And based on how many requests essentially are buffered, like how much um, 
let's say the write pressure you have, it will try to empty those uh, that write buffer uh, in you know by by scheduling as many write requests as possible at a time, and then switch back to read mode because switching from read mode to write mode um, will induce a performance overhead, latency overhead, because we have to pay for the bus turner on time. So what it does is basically executes writes in a batch, and then come and, and then. Uh, Obviously, at some point, it has to switch back to serving read requests. So those decisions are also important, but we won't cover uh, those details in, in this lecture. But I'll refer you to stuff that you can look at. OK, so let's look at scheduling policies. Uh, these first come, first serve is a very simple scheduling policy. Basically, what you do is you have this request in your bank queues. And you select the oldest request, and you uh, you serve the commands associated with those requests, and you get the request. You you basically serve the request and get get it done. But this is correct, so you can you can apply a, a F, FCFS policy, and you can guarantee correct DRAM operation. But correctness is not just uh, just correctness is not enough because your memory controller might perform very poorly, and you have to develop memory controllers that perform scheduling in a high performance manner, basically. And I, I hope that's clear why we want high performance controllers, right? Not just correct ones. Now, a better scheduling policy that will enable a higher DRAM throughput is first ready, first come, first serve. What this does is it prioritizes requests that hit in the raw buffer first, and then it will schedule requests that are oldest. Uh, this is a lower level detail. Basically, scheduling is not, I, I've been talking about request scheduling, but the schedu scheduling is done at command granularity. So first, you have already translated the, the commands that needs to be executed to, for you to serve a request. And then uh, you do the scheduling at the command level, meaning that you select from those DRAM commands that you need to, uh, that you need to issue. Okay. So this is, a high-level overview of a DRAM bank operation. I'll try to describe the difference between FR, uh, FCFS and FCFS here. So we have multiple columns and rows. And we have the row buffer, which is essentially a cache for a row, right? So we, if you remember, we will fetch a row to this row buffer, and we will serve the read and write requests from the row buffer. So let's access uh, row 0, column 0. So this will put row address 0 through the row decoder and enable the first row. And once we enable the first row, its data will be copied to the row buffer. And now we can serve our column access uh, through the row buffer using the column the multiplexer. Uh, sorry, column multiplexer. And we can fetch our data to the memory controller and then serve it to whoever, it, uh, whoever wanted that data. Uh, now, when another request arrives, this is a row buffer hit because it targets the same row uh, that's in the row buffer. Uh, it, Access, it turned out to access the same row as the previous request, and it accesses a different column, so we can serve it very fast through the row buffer as a row buffer hit. Now, imagine if we had a request that, um, sorry, let me animate this a bit more. So the next access turned out to be also to the same row, but let's imagine a case where we had another request to serve before this request. And that targets a different row and some other column. Right? So if we apply the FCFS policy, you would select that request instead of this one. And we would have to pay the penalty of the latency penalty of closing the row and activating the row uh, another row again and reading the data from there. And then we close it and then open this same row zero again. Uh, now that's, that will incur a very large latency in the, um, in the critical path of this row zero, column 85 request. So what FRFCFS does in that case is it will serve this request first that you see here, row zero, column 85. So this request doesn't get um, that high latency penalty of closing the row, uh, activating another row again. And the penalty on the other request that we didn't service is very small, right? Because it's just the row buffer hit latency. Okay, yeah, so this is a row buffer conflict. 
and you access a different row, you have to close the row, which takes around 15 nanoseconds. And then you have to activate another row, which takes around 35, 40 nanoseconds. Depends highly on the interface you have. This is the case for DDR4, DDR5. You fetched again, and you paid for a 50 nanosecond latency, essentially. OK. Any questions? Yes. Can you use the microphone? Uh, simple question, but a column, how wide is it typically? Uh, it, uh... The interface width, you mean? Or... Like you, you can select the row and then the column, but a column, how wide is it? Is it like a cache line width or something? Yeah, yeah. the highest level, let's say we're working with a DDR4 chip in our PC uh, or the DDR4 module in that case, one column you can think of as one cache line, which is 512 bits. So each read or a write request typically writes or reads a cache line. Uh, if you go down the, to the chip level, things get complicated quite fast. So a column is actually, uh, I'd say, eight bits. But with each read, you fetch eight columns. That's 64 bits. And then you have eight chips on a module. And then that's 512 bits. <laughs> yeah. But at the, at the processor level, memory controller level, the important thing is uh, we fetch a cache line with each read or write. OK, uh, well, scheduling is important because hopefully of that example, you understand why scheduling is important. Uh, scheduling is, in the end, a prioritiz uh, prioritization order. And it can be based on many uh, parameters, like the request's age. Uh, first come, first serve, for example, prioritizes all the requests. Robuffer hit miss status. First ready, first, first serve prioritizes robuffer hits over all these requests. And then we have we can look at request types. Is it a prefetch request, a read, or a write request? And as I, I mentioned, we, we don't want to deal with write requests as they arrive immediately. Right? So we will buffer them somewhere else, and we will, uh, we, will try to, we will try to serve them later and in batches. And then the requester type, is it a load miss or a store miss? Now, this also relates to that write request. Uh, issue I mentioned. So if it's if it's a store miss that we're dealing with, we might not need. So store miss. Uh, let me put it into context. A store miss also might read a cache line, right? It's not a write request to the DRAM chip. Uh, we missed a cache line in a, in the last level cache, but to make sure that we're, uh, we're maintaining coherency and consistency in, in our chips and in, in our processor, we have to bring that cache line to last level cache before we can write anything on top of it. So that translates to a read request in the memory controller. But it originates from a store miss. And store misses still have the same characteristic of uh, basically the processor being able to tolerate them more easily, tolerate their latencies. Uh, so if we know a if a request is a store miss, we can choose to delay it a bit more than uh, if we have a load miss generate a request. And then uh, request criticality, you can try to understand what's the dependency chain in your processor uh, reorder buffer, for example, for instructions that this load miss is based on. Uh, the, the, this, they depend on this load miss, basically. And if that's a very long uh, dependency chain, you might want to favor it. You might want to serve it earlier so that you utilize your uh, processor resources more. And you can look at these uh, properties to, to decide if, if a request is critical or not. Is it the oldest miss in the core and how many instructions depend on it? And will it stall the processor and so on? Now, in multi-core systems or multiple agent system, heterogeneous systems, you can think about the interface cost to other cores. We will try to cover this if time permits in our lecture today. And you can think about other things that's not listed here. Right? So now I'll move on to robot for management policies. And this is uh, quite simple, actually. So typically, you have two policies to apply here and a combination of both. The first one is open row policy. You keep the row open after an access. But the other condition is you don't have anything in your request buffer. So you don't know what the next access is. 
you're anticipating the next access will hit in the row buffer. That means that the next access will access the same row as the previous access. And if it needs a different row, you have to pay for the row conflict latency, basically. The other policy is closed row policy here. You close the row uh, after the, the last access. Again, the same condition applies, right? You don't know what the next request is. You don't see it as the memory controller yet. Uh, if the next access hits in a different row, compared to the case where you apply the open row policy, you avoided the row conflict, so you don't pay that extra row conflict latency. If the uh, next request accesses the same row, you have to uh, pay for that extra activation latency compared to when you apply the open row policy. There are also adaptive policies that predict when uh, this, this next request that we don't know as the memory controller where it will access. And if you can predict it very well, you can choose to apply open row policy for some requests and closed row policy for some other requests. Now, this is a simulation of what happens when you have open and closed row policies. So we'll go line by line here. The, we applied the open row policy. The first access was to row zero, and the next access turned out to access row zero as well. We only have to send a read command, and it's very fast. One, two nanoseconds, done. And in case it was to a different row, meaning we have a row conflict, we have to pay for pre-charge, activate, and read latency, which is more in the order of 40, 50 nanoseconds. That's like 20 times almost increase, I would say. Yeah. That's it for open row. And for the closed row policy, uh, if you access row zero, and the next access turned out to access row zero also, uh, well, this is in the request buffer here. Right? So this is the difference. Uh, if it's in the request buffer, if there's a request in the request buffer, that accesses the same row, you don't want to apply a closed policy in a dumb way, right? You know that there's a row hit, so why do you close the row after accessing it? So in that case, you will still only pay for the read latency. That's easy. And in case you don't know what the next request is, and if you closed it, that's line four here, uh, and it turned out the next request turned out to access the same row, you have to pay for the activate latency and then read latency. And then after accessing that, you might also pre-charge that row, right? Uh, so this is this is the case when you close the row, but the next request turned out to access the same row. And if it's to a different row, you have to pay for activate plus read latencies. The difference is, in this case, in this last case, you're not paying for the pre-charged latency as well compared to the open page policy here, right? So this saves you some time. If if your request, if your uh, if your accesses are very if your workload accesses are very random and kind of sparse in time, so you don't know where the next access will go to, they're not in your request buffer, it's better to use closed page policy. If you have a streaming application that has a very high row buffer hit rate, it makes sense to use the open page policy. And if you can predict very well what, where the next access will go, it's probably better to use a combination of both. Any questions? It's clear so far, I guess, right? Cool. Good. Okay. Uh, that gave you the glimpse of performance in context of memory controllers, I hope. And we'll look at power very briefly now. So we also have different power modes in our DRAM chips. And the key idea is we don't want to waste energy. So why not close or shut down the, the chip or power it off when we're not accessing it? So we have these power states. That, I mean, we have more power states in different interfaces, but this covers uh, the important ones, I guess. We have the active states where we have the highest power consumption and all banks idle power down and self-refresh. Now, power down is a weird naming because you expect it to have the lowest power consumption, but it's not. Uh, it basically means that you don't have any uh, bank, any, any row activated in any of the banks. And you're not performing any uh, refresh operation as well. And the self-refresh self mode uh, uh, consumes the least amount of power. So if you probably are not using your phone right now, it's hopefully in self-refresh. It's DRAM chips are in self-refresh mode. The trade-off is, so basically, now that you've seen this, why don't we keep 
our chips in self refresh mode the moment when we don't have any request in the request buffer right uh, the the issue is we need to spend some time to transition the chip into self refresh mode and even more time to bring it back to the active mode where we can uh, send it requests so i uh, there's a chance i'm wrong but i believe the self refresh to active state transition takes in the order of a few microseconds, that's a lot of latency. Okay. So you might have gotten a glimpse of why DRAM control is sort of difficult, but there's more. Uh, we need to obey DRAM timing parameters. There are tons of timing parameters, and um, there are more than 50 timing parameters, in, in fact. Uh, some interesting ones are right to read and uh, TRC, the minimum number of cycles between uh, issuing two consecutive activate commands to the same bank. And in the previous lectures, we've seen techniques that try to reduce this. And the memory controller needs to keep track of many resources, uh, such as which, uh, one, one metadata, one very simple metadata is which row is open in which bank, right? So that you can understand if a, a next request is a row hit or a row miss or a row conflict. It needs to manage channels, banks, right? metadata about banks, ranks, uh, data bus, address bus, and row buffers. It needs to handle DRAM refresh. It needs to periodically perform refresh operations. It has the flexibility to delay refresh operations to some extent. So that's, that adds complexity as well. Uh, the memory controller can delay some refresh requests if it anticipates that there will be more latency critical requests from originating from the processor that will arrive in its request buffer right? But if it delays some refresh requests, it has to now perform more refresh requests in a smaller amount of time in the near future. So then if it predicts that wrong, uh, it might need to induce more latency on more critical requests. And predicting that is also complex, right? And now in the new DDR5 and HBM3 standard, there's also refresh management. The memory controller is also responsible for, sorry, uh, I said refresh management. Uh, well, it's called refresh management, but it's a raw hammer mitigation technique, basically. The memory controller has to keep track of how many activates it sent to each bank. And the moment those no number of activates exceed some predetermined thresholds, uh, it has to issue specialized commands again. This is similar to refresh, but it needs more metadata to track uh, to be able to issue those requests. It needs to manage power consumption, as we've seen in the previous slide. And finally, we also have we also want to optimize for performance uh, and quality of service, uh, especially in the presence of constraints. Uh, now, those constraints can be your maybe you're a business, you have some cloud infrastructure. Now you guarantee your customers that you will be able to respond to a query in 200 nanoseconds, for example. This, I don't know if this is a case in reality, but then what happens is. Um, if you apply poor scheduling decisions, you might not guarantee that you will uh, meet that 200 nanosecond uh, deadline all the time, right? So you have to have predictable performance as well, where you need it. Yeah, you don't need it everywhere. Okay, those, those are the overall reasons why DRAM controller design is complex. Now, there are more timing constraints. Uh, there were about 50 of them, as you remember. And these two papers discuss these timing uh, constraints in a very clear way. Uh, you can see some nice figures that depict how much time you need to wait between a uh, combination of DRAM commands. And I, yeah, basically, that's good. Uh, we can use it later. Anyways, I was saying, uh, Yes, these two papers describe them really nicely. So if you want to learn more about them, I definitely recommend you uh, to read these. And I'll just ask a question here. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we have a single timing constraint? Because we, we have to deal with all of these, right? Uh, and that adds complexity to our memory controllers. But if we were to have a single timing constraint, it will simplify memory controller design, but it would, it would worsen performance, right? because you will have to pick the largest or the, 
the, the highest latency timing parameter if you want to apply a single timing parameter. And that will, that will significantly reduce your performance. Now, your read latency, it was two nanoseconds before, now it's 52 nanoseconds. Right? It's not something you want. Uh, now, this is because we have the synchronous interface between the DRAM controller and the DRAM chips, meaning that the DRAM controller knows what's going to happen and how long it's going to take when it issues a DRAM command. So if it issues an activate command and then a read command after that, it knows the read command, it needs to wait for 13.5 nanoseconds and the read command will return some value after some nanoseconds. Right? It knows all of these. Um, but if we were to have an asynchronous interface, a more packet-based interface, for example, if the memory controller didn't care about any of these timing parameters, it just simply sent some requests to the DRAM chip and expected the DRAM chip to return to those read and write requests, only the data, right? That will simplify things on the memory controller side. But that also means now the memory controller, the analog properties of our DRAM chips didn't change. We still need to obey these timing parameters. We have essentially offloaded that responsibility to the DRAM chip. And DRAM chips don't work, well, uh, maybe a better way to explain that is, you cannot implement logic as easily in DRAM chips because you have to use a different um, manufacturing technology, essentially, that's not very uh, CMOS friendly or logic friendly in, inside DRAM. So you want to keep the memory controller closer to the processor, I guess, because of that. But that might change. Uh, this figure tries to describe the timing constraints in a bit more detail. So I'll, I'll go over it quickly because I think this was covered. Basically, this is just one example. We will send an activate command and then a read command. Uh, you know already how the, the RAM uh, how we access DRAM cells, how the analog operation works, right? So this is a this plot is showing the bit line voltage over y axis, and we have time over the x axis. We send two commands: one activate, one read, and you see how the bit line voltage changes uh, across time. Now this time parameter has a name: it's TRCD or uh, activation latency. This is the minimum amount of time we must wait. Uh, before sending a read command, after sending an activate command, so that we have an IO readable value or ready to access voltage level in the bit line. Now, this specific self manipulated the bit line in this way. Right? In theory, we could have shortened TRCD, uh, we could have cut it here as well, right? Because it exceeded the ready to access voltage level here. The issue is, uh, we have, due to process variation, other cells that will manipulate the voltage differently. So we have to, we have to think about the cell that's the weakest in terms of um, how it uh, manipulates the bit line voltage. And we have to set our timing parameters to account for uh, those weaknesses in process, due to process variations. That's why we have a mono, like we, we have a single timing parameter that's quite long, actually, according to previous research that showed you can reduce this timing parameter, uh, reduce the guard bands a lot significantly for many real DRAM chips, uh, in many real DRAM chips. But this is basically why we have timing parameters. We want to ensure uh, that we cover the weakest, we, we have enough time for the weakest cells to participate in charge sharing properly. Uh, due to process variation. Okay, uh, this is the subarray level parallelism paper that nicely describes other timing parameters. This is instead, so if you ever need to, to study a DRAM uh, standard, to read a DRAM standard manual, it might be good to have, to, to look at these papers for reference as well, because this is, uh, this describes the timing parameters much more clearly than uh, the standard does. Okay, more timing constraints from the TL DRAM paper that Girai covered in the past lecture. And yeah, okay, I'll move on to the essentially next part of the lecture. Uh, well, I don't know, it's been 45 minutes. Should we take a break?
You can take a 10 minute break because I'm going already too fast. Do you have any questions before the break on YouTube? No? Okay, cool. Then uh, let's meet here at past 10 again. Yeah.
Okay, it's past ten, so let's continue. Okay, so uh, we've seen why DRAM control might be difficult, but it's going to be more difficult as we add, keep adding more components to our systems. We have CPUs, GPUs, hardware accelerators, uh, network devices attached to our systems today, and they share the same uh, me memory, essentially. And there's more and more interference uh, generated between those components and the memory system. And you have to satisfy more and more timing parameters for new memory types, especially if we have multiple memory types in the same system. And then we have to also uh, satisfy many goals at the same time, performance, fairness, uh, quality of service, energy efficiency, and possibly other things. There's design complexity also. 
you don't want to have a lot of logic spent on just controlling memory. Uh, another difficulty I would say is uh, performing all those maintenance operations like refresh is the most obvious one. And then row hammer defense is something new, but it's very important. It's also a management uh, maintenance mechanism as you, if you think about it, because if you don't perform those tasks properly, you will have errors in your system and you don't want errors in your memory. There's another maintenance mechanism, for example, uh, where we have error correcting codes. We want to periodically read and write back corrected data to the DRAM chips. If we, when we have error correcting codes, this will allow us to tolerate some of the single bit errors because we can correct them. Um, and if we don't do this periodically, what will happen is there will be more and more errors due to random effects uh, accumulating in the, in, the, in the same region where we can no longer, uh, if, if there are more than a single bit error, we can no longer, or multiple bit errors, uh, our ECC can no longer tolerate it. So we want to prevent that from happening. So we periodically read data, um, perform the ECC correction on it, and then write it back. This is another maintenance mechanism. It's called memory scrubbing. This self-managing DRAM paper is a, a recent work that we done. Hassan, it was part of Hassan Hassan's thesis. And it allows the, the system designer to offload those maintenance mechanisms to DRAM chips. This uh, will, basically in the paper we argue that, and we show that this uh, simplifies memory management, memory controlling. And it also has other benefits. I'll try to, uh, I'll, I'll briefly describe this paper. Uh, the problem is the memory controller manages all these DRAM maintenance operations that I just talked about and that are listed here. And changes to these mechanisms uh, are often reflected to the memory controller design, DRAM interface, other system components. For example, if you, um, in, I will give more examples in the next slides, but this is just one prominent example. In DDR4, we have refresh at rank granularity. That means we send a refresh command and the chip refreshes multiple rows from all banks at the same time. In DDR5 and in other standards, you have what's called a bank level refresh, where you send a refresh command targeting a single bank, and the, memory, uh, and the chip will only refresh the rows in that bank. Now what you gain is you can still exploit bank level parallelism while that refresh operation in one bank is going on. So this will allow you to uh, have performance benefits in cases where you can still uh, exploit that bank level parallelism. And that's, for example, one of the changes that's reflected on the interface and the memory controller. And implementing new maintenance mechanisms or modifying the existing ones is difficult to realize. And that's because it requires changes to the standard. So these are example new features of DDR5 compared to DDR4. I talked about same bank refresh. There is row uh, hammer protection in the form of refresh management that I described in the, um, in the previous slides. Basically, the memory controller has to do some bookkeeping. It has to count how many activated sends to each bank, and then it, send, it needs to send a specialized RFM command to a bank when the activation count of that bank exceeds a certain threshold. And this, change, uh, this requires changes in the interface and the memory controller. Finally, there's memory scrubbing in DDR5. Now, this also requires changes in your controllers. These are difficult to implement because they were only possible after multiple years uh, required to develop a new DRAM standard. Now, uh, this is more, so it's, it's not like these changes were difficult to implement in the standard, but the standard encompasses too many things. It, it, it standardizes, um, for example, things about the analog operation of the, of the signals. And basically the manufacturers have to get together, agree on a bunch of things. And this process takes a long time. And the new maintenance mechanisms that are required to make sure our chips are reliable need to wait before we standardize a new DRAM standard. And self-managing DRAM, enables autonomous Indira maintenance uh, operations. And the key idea here is to prevent 
the memory. Con so let me uh, let me state what this will allow. Uh, this will allow the ma manufacturers to develop new maintenance mechanisms and realize them in their chips without requiring changes to DRAM standards. Right? So you don't have to wait for another seven years for DDR6 to come up. Uh, if they were to implement SMD in DDR5, you wouldn't have to wait for DDR6 to come up if you want to improve your row hammer protection mechanism inside your chips. The key idea is to prevent the memory controller from accessing DRAM regions that are doing maintenance operations. And the way to do that is by rejecting an activate command. It's very simple. Uh, this is a picture depicting the, the interface between a memory controller and a DRAM chip. What we add on top of this interface is just a conceptual act, not acknowledge pin. This DRAM chip drives the signal when the memory controller accesses accidentally a region that's performing a maintenance operation. Now, I said conceptual because you don't have to add a new pin, essentially, because DDR4 and DDR5 has this specialized, uh, special purpose alert end signal that's used when uh, data written to DRAM chip fails some reliability checks or integrity checks. So the DRAM chip can already warn the memory controller and tell it to perform an, uh, perform an operation again. So you can use that also. Don't have to add a new pin. And by leveraging this ability to reject and activate, uh, and maintenance, you can implement new maintenance operations, and you can implement them completely inside the DRAM chip. You don't need the memory controller to perform, for example, refresh anymore. Now I'll uh, talk about the high-level bank architecture in SMD. So this is a DRAM bank. It's conceptually split into multiple regions. The, these are collection of DRAM rows inside the bank. And basically, we had a new table, uh, a table of bits that indicate which region is under maintenance. So for example, if lock bit 0 is set, this means that region 0 is performing a maintenance operation. And consequently, if the, OK, this is moving on on its own, sorry. Uh, if the memory controller sends an activate to that locked region, we will just reject it by uh, setting the ACNAC pin. This is a slide describing the high-level operation of SMD. We want to send the activate command to bank 0 and lock region 0. Now that region is locked, so the DRAM chip will respond with an act max signal. And after a predetermined retry interval, the memory controller will send an activate command again to the same lock region, assuming that it's no longer under maintenance. Now, while this is going on, other banks uh, can, or other lock regions, can perform these activate operations. So basically, the memory controller can parallelize uh, accesses with maintenance operations because there are the other lock regions that are not under maintenance can uh, receive these regular DRAM commands. And in the paper, we implement three high-level mechanisms. So for DRAM refresh, we have a fixed rate uh, SMD-FR refresh mechanism that is basically the same refresh mechanism in DDR4, but inside the DRAM chip. We have the variable rate refresh mechanism that skips refreshes for rows that can, uh, uh, that can retain data for longer than the standard uh, refresh window, the default refresh period. For row hammer protection, we have a probabilistic mechanism that you've seen in the past row hammer lecture. It's it's basically para inside the DRAM chip. And the deterministic mechanism is, is like graphene in the DRAM chip. So just to remind you, uh, sorry, I have bugs with the slide apparently. Uh, the PRP or uh, probabilistic mechanism, when you activate a DRAM row, it's with, a, uh, with, with a probability, it will just assume that that's an aggressor row and schedule uh, preventive refresh operations to its neighbors. And the deterministic mechanism keep tracks, it keeps track of uh, rows that are most frequently activated. And if they uh, reach to a point where they would induce row hammer bit Phillips in neighboring rows, we perform preventive refresh operations. And for memory scrubbing, we also have a mechanism that periodically scans the entire DRAM row and corrects errors if there are any. So we implement all of those mechanisms inside our SMD chip, and we 
uh, basically perform some simulations using Remulator. And here you see the speed ups we have for different combinations of um, configurations of SMD. Here, SMD FR is the fixed rate refresh. And uh, VR is the variable rate refresh. Now, SMD uh, PRP, probabilistic grow hammer protection, and DRP also includes fixed rate refresh. Basically, anything that's not VR or variable rate refresh also includes fixed rate refresh. And SMD combined is basically variable rate refresh, deterministic protection, and memory scrubbing all in the same chip. No refresh is the baseline that we use to show what's the upper limit, basically, in the current. So if, you, if you don't do any refresh operations in your, DRAM, in your memory controller, what would you have in terms of performance in, in a real system, a DDR4 system? And we see that uh, while no refresh per, uh, gains us 10% speed up, SMD combined also, uh, SMD combined provides comparable speed up to that no refresh, ba uh, basically, um, no refresh configuration. It improves performance by 9.2%. Uh, why? Because we have offloaded all the maintenance mechanisms to the DRAM chip, and we can parallelize accesses to different lock regions. That helps a lot also. And the plot on the right shows the, the energy consumption for the same configurations. As you can see, we uh, have energy consumption that's close to no refresh, uh, the no refresh configuration as well. This is, these were the results for single core. Now this is a system where we have four cores, so the memory intensity is higher in, in, in the end. And even in a four core system, we have performance benefits and energy benefits comparable to the no refresh uh, configuration. And we conclude that SMD-based maintenance mechanisms have significant performance and energy efficiency benefits. Now we also look at SMD's performance benefits uh, and their sensitivity to refresh period. The standard refresh period in DDR4 is 64 milliseconds today. In DDR5, it's 32 milliseconds. And if you heat the DDR5 chip up to 80, more than 85 degrees Celsius today, you need to apply a 60 millisecond refresh period. And eight milliseconds is really uh, sort of futuristic, but I think we will get there very soon. As the refresh period decreases, SMD's benefits also increase because more of those um, intrusive refresh operations, the chip can perform them on its own. The memory controller does not have to deal with that. And a refresh operation no longer uh, prevents us from accessing the uh, other DRAM banks or other lock regions that's not under maintenance. So our benefits increase with increasing refresh period. And we also evaluate the hardware overheads of SMD. So the interface modifications are minimal. You can choose two approaches. You can implement a new pin uh, per module in case you have a module, or per chip in case you have multiple chips in your system but not a module. You can share those pins also. Uh, uh, basically, you need to, uh, yeah, if, if you have a module, basically, you can add a single pin between the, uh, the, the, the socket where the module is placed in your process. In case you have multiple chips, unfortunately, you have to add multiple pins. But the, the overhead is very small compared to how many pins you have in today's systems. The second approach is to repurpose the existing signal, alert 10, and use it for uh, activate rejection as well, as well as whatever purpose it has today. Uh, the benefits of the first approach is it's more simple. You don't have to uh, add more meanings, essentially, to an existing signal. but uh, it's also more costly because you're adding new pins. The disadvantage of repurposing the existing signal is that it adds more complexity. The memory controller has to deal with a bit more uh, management complexity. Inside the DRAM chip, we implement the lock region table, which is very small. It, according to our evaluation, takes 0.001% of a modern DRAM chip. And it has a very small access latency, so it, uh, it doesn't increase the critical path in your DRAM chip. And the changes to the memory controller, well, the memory controller now has to 
work with act next signals. That means when it sends an activate, it needs to uh, it needs to reissue that activate if it receives an act next command. Now that's additional logic. There's additional logic in the memory controller to support that. And one more thing that's not here. It also will slightly. Uh, it will require modification to the existing scheduling mechanisms we have. FRFCFS, you might apply it, but you have to adapt it a little because now your requests can, you, you might need to reschedule your requests. Uh, there are no further changes needed for new maintenance operations in the memory controller. So this is good. The, the manufacturer has to implement them in the chip itself. And the memory controller no longer manages the maintenance operations. There are more uh, details in the paper, like how the performance benefits and energy benefits change with lock region size. Uh, compares, we compare SMD to memory controller-based row hammer protection mechanisms and scrubbing and DRP, the deterministic row hammer protection. We also analyze how the benefits change with the maximum activation threshold, this is a parameter you would configure according to your DRAM chip's row hammer vulnerability. And then uh, there's the victim row window sensitivity study. So uh, I'll skip this and I'll refer you to our paper if you're interested in it. And do you have any questions about SMD? No, 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 good. Cool. Now going back to this uh, outline sort of slide, DRAM controller design is becoming more difficult. Uh, and it would be really good if we, if we could design a policy, scheduling policy, that would maximize performance, quality of service, energy efficiency, everything at the same time. But there are too many things to consider because the state of our system continues to change and those state changes result in different essentially conditions that that makes finding that optimal policy difficult, but I'll describe that a bit more in, in a bit more detail. So the workload behavior also changes continuously. And would it be good if the DRAM controller could automatically find that scheduling policy on its own? This is talking about first come, first serve, first ready, first come, first serve like scheduling policies. Okay, so the memory controller resolves memory contention by scheduling these requests, memory contention is basically multiple cores trying to access uh, our memory, right? And how do we schedule requests to maximize system performance? And if we want to have a um, mechanism that continuously learns and adapts to changing uh, system conditions and workload be behavior, that will be really good. But uh, yeah, so the problem here is DRAM controllers are difficult to design because we work with heuristics, right? We, uh, it's difficult for human designers to design a policy that can adapt itself to various um, system state and different workloads. And our idea here is to develop a memory controller that adapts itself to uh, workload behavior and system conditions. And we want to use machine learning here. And we found that, uh, well, uh, Professor Mutla in the past found that Reinforcement learning maps nicely to memory control, essentially. Uh, and the, they designed a memory controller that is a reinforcement learning agent. And it tries to learn and employ the best scheduling policy to maximize uh, long-term performance. Long-term performance here is really uh, DRAM throughput. So this is a high-level view of a reinforcement learning agent. You see the agent here and the environment there, what this means is basically uh, the agent takes an action and that results in a change in the environment. The environment is, not, is our system essentially. And when the agent takes an action, it also gets a reward from the system based on the action it took. And it can observe the various state information in the environment. This will make more sense when I put this up. So in our case, the agent is the scheduler. It schedules commands. That's the actions it performs. And it observes as a reward. It gets a reward uh, in terms of data bus utilization. And the state attributes I'll describe in more detail in the upcoming slides. And our goal here is to 
uh, choose actions that will maximize the reward we get. Okay, so this is a this is the high level idea of self-optimizing DRAM controllers, obviously in the context of reinforcement learning. And our goal is to dynamically adapt the memory scheduling policy by interacting with the system at runtime. Uh, the system associates rewards. Uh, sorry, the system associate uh, state and action pairs with long-term reward values. Uh, and this can be implemented as a table. Well, I probably won't show you that picture, but what we have is uh, system state encoded in terms of you know, some integer values and actions that we take, again, encoded as integer values. And then we put those in rows and columns of our table. And what we have in the cells is the reward. And we update that table based on the actions we take on what state we observe. Uh, and the goal of the memory controller is to schedule the command at a, at, at a given system state that will result in the highest long-term reward value. And we'll continue to update these values and it will essentially learn how to work in a dynamically changing environment. Now more details are in the paper and here are the, here I'll elaborate on the state's actions and rewards we have. So the reward function is very simple. Uh, this kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of easy, the reward function, because the authors had to simplify it a bit because this is like the first paper that deals with this problem, right? And when you have a single activation, this reward function works nicely because you're optimizing throughput and that's the only performance um, well, metric that single application essentially needs to optimize. If you have multiple applications, that's, diff that's a different issue and we'll elaborate on that in later slides. And our goal is to maximize long-term, long sorry, uh, data bus utilization. And the state attributes, some of them are listed here. Number of reads, writes, load misses in the transaction queue, number of pending writes and ROB heads waiting for reference row, and the, the memory requests order in the ROB. That will hint to how, uh, how many dependent instructions are there based on that request. And the actions are just the DRAM commands that the controller can schedule. Evaluate the performance of this scheduling mechanism, and it's quite good. It, it has benefits over FRFCFS, and its improvements are robust. So we see the improvement over various types of workloads, essentially. Okay. Uh, why is this good? We're no longer stuck with the same heuristic-based policy. That's FRFCFS, for example. The heuristic there is, if it's a row hit, I will uh, serve that first and then the oldest instruction. Uh, so, the system, so this scheduler can learn uh, based on the changing environment. It can adapt to these changes. Also, the, the system designer uh, does not need to find those heuristics that will result in the best performance, right? They only need to find or enumerate the system uh, variables, what the reinforcement lear uh, learning agent observes from the system. They need to enumerate those, uh, um, those variables and then let the agent essentially optimize for itself. And then obviously a target to optimize for. In this case, it's DRAM throughput. But if you have a multiple system, multiple multi-core system where you have multiple um, requesters and you want to be fair, probably having this as a goal won't work out really nicely. Now, specifying this relates to this bullet. Specifying objectives objectives are difficult, especially in um, multi-agent systems. The hardware area is more complex compared to FRFCFS. Hard hardware complexity is uh, is worse compared to FRFCFS because you have to have this uh, state action pair table, right, and the rewards and all that stuff. And and also, this is an important point. I think the Design mindset needs to change a bit for you to implement this. This is relating to the to testing more than uh, you know everything else. Testing and verification of this mechanism is a bit more difficult because you'd no longer have that nice uh, thing where you if, if you have FRFCFS uh, in your scheduler, you have inputs maybe to that scheduler 
uh, the inputs to that scheduler are just the request buffer state, right? And the output you would observe is always the same given the same input because it doesn't really hold a state. It observes the request queue, it picks the row buffer hit first, and then the oldest request first, and so on. But if you were to test or validate uh, or ver verify the machine learning based or the, the RL agent here, reinforcement learning agent schedule mechanism here, you cannot decouple it from the state it has observed so far and the rewards it, it has optimized so far, right? Um, so given, a, given an input buffer, it might perform differently if it has observed a different state. So you have to, to test it. You have to uh, maintain that state. And in your simulations, you have to make sure. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a bit difficult, basically, to, to test the same set of inputs and to have a golden model and so on. OK, I hope that was clear. Do you have any questions about uh, SMD or reinforcement learning based memory controllers? OK. Cool. Again, this is the paper. And this is an example to such an architecture, right? That self-optimized and data-driven architecture. And we'll talk more about this. And in architecture design today, we have um, human-driven designs and human-driven de uh, design, humans design the policies. And these are short-sighted policies. And they're especially in operating system, for example, there are um, many decision-making short-sighted policies that just make decisions based on hand-tuned thresholds, heuristics, essentially. And there's no automatic data-driven uh, policy learning, almost no learning in our systems. And uh, we should try to design more intelligent, fundamentally intelligent architectures. Intelligent architecture should be data-driven and sophisticated. It's workload-driven. It should change according to your system uh, and according to the environment and uh, workload, uh, work workload behavior. And if you think about it, all controllers or memory controllers are intelligent data-driven agents, but it does, they don't really, they're not, they have access to data, but they don't do much with it. And in some cases, they don't have access to data. But given access to data, uh, they can do a lot. So we can rethink the design of controllers in this context. And uh, I guess our group has done so for some uh, for some time now. We have self-optimizing memory prefetcher. If you're interested in these things, I would like you to take a look at these papers that I'm going to show. We have more learning-based off-chip load predictors. This ties nicely to the prefetching uh, mechanism in the previous slide. And we also have self-optimizing uh, hybrid SSD controllers. And these are data-centric, data-driven, data-aware. And here is a list of key problems with today's architecture that relates to the previous slide, essentially. And a, a, another remark is basically, this is a very efficient machine that's very intelligent, and it's good at learning things and making decisions. Uh, this is a much more intelligent system than what we have in architectures today. And we could get there. We could get there by, um, you know, by thinking across the entire stack and improving things step by step. And Professor Mutlu talks about these issues and more intelligent computing systems in his, uh, in his talks. This is a paper, invited paper. Uh, this is another tutorial on fundamental better architectures. Uh, there are talks on YouTube. And this is, I guess, the most recent uh, talk he delivered on this topic. So if you're interested, please take a look. And also we have, uh, we had Geraldo present in last week's seminar lecture, a different version of the same uh, topic, essentially. Now I will move to, I guess, a, so this is, a, this is going to be about quality of service in um, share, or basically shared resource design for multi-core systems. So we're transitioning to the next part of the lecture. It's still about memory controllers uh, to some extent, but uh, we're going to focus on quality of service. Uh, so I'll start by motivating why we have shared resources uh, first. This is a picture of 
of a, of a system today, right? We have a lot of memory components, a lot of shared components, the shared L3 cache, memory, storage, and the interconnect is even shared. But why do we share things? Because uh, it allows us to, it allows to use, utilize resources better, essentially. Instead of dedicating a hardware resource to a single hardware context or a hardware thread, and you can think of that as an application, right? We allow multiple context users. Think of it as a, uh, as a core, not an application. Uh, example resources are functional units. We have simultaneous multi-threaded uh, systems where, uh, uh, where two threads in the same core share the same functional units even, right? One, when one core cannot utilize the functional unit, the other core can. We have the pipe, we have pipelines, caches, buses, memory, interconnect storage, a lot of shared components. Why? Because it improves utilization and efficiency. Because when a, uh, when a hardware context cannot utilize that shared resource, other hardware contexts can. And it also reduces communication latency. For example, shared data, if you keep it in the same cache in simultaneous multiple thread processes, they will uh, access that data uh, is more, more like faster. It's compatible with the shared memory model. So if you want to share, um, say, a range of memory addresses with a different application, it makes sense to put them. It, it doesn't make sense to have multiple copies of it in multiple non-shared components. The disadvantages are uh, it results in a contention for resources. When the resources are not idle, you cannot take control of those resources. And if cache space, for example, is occupied by one thread, another thread needs to first occupy it to work with it, to read data from there. And this sometimes reduces uh, each thread or some threads or both threads performance. And it can be worse. The, 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 thread, the thread's performance can be worse than when it's run alone in the system. And it eliminates performance isolation, so you cannot get the same performance out of your uh, application every time you run it. Uh, depends on co-executing threads. So if you execute a thread with a certain memory uh, access behavior, for example, you will get a different performance. If you execute it with a different thread, you will get a different performance. You cannot predict your performance anymore. And it degrades quality of service because it causes unfairness. And I'll, I'll describe this in more detail uh, with examples. And therefore, we need to efficiently and fairly utilize these shared resources. This is a problem with shared resources, unfortunately. This is an example. So we have two processor cores here, two threads running on each core. T1, uh, when it's run alone, it occupies this much cache, cache space, the, the blue highlighted regions. And when T2 is run alone in the system, it needs this much cache, cache space. Now, when you run them together, T1 occupies more cache space than T2. T1 has less of a slowdown than, than T2, but this is not fair, right? T2's throughput is significantly reduced due to unfair cache uh, sharing in this case. And this paper deals with uh, this problem and uh, pr proposes a fair cache sharing and partitioning uh, mechanism architecture. Now that was in caches, but we will get to memory controllers and memory soon. So why is unpredictable performance bad? First, it makes programmer's life difficult. You have profiled your application, you optimized it in, when, in a case when it's run alone in the system. Now you're running it with other cores and you no longer can guarantee uh, if your optimizations work or if you get the same performance or what performance you get, you don't even know. It causes discomfort to users. For example, a, an important application can starve, right? Uh, when, you, when you, I don't know, pick your phone out of your pocket, you should immediately turn on. But if... I don't know, some applications trying to bring some notification to you from uh, somewhere and it starved the resources that your lock opening function needs to have, then you will have some latency. It will cause some discomfort to you. This is not the best example to give. There are probably more severe cases where this causes more discomfort. And it makes system management difficult. I touched on this a bit. How do you enforce the service level agreement? How do you tell your, for example, customers that you will make sure to serve them under 200 nanoseconds for their query? Then you don't know how hardware resource sharing is going to affect your performance. Okay, so sharing improves our throughput. So we want that because it allows us to better utilize 
space, space in terms of chip area, for example, right? But partitioning will also provide performance isolation, of, but at the cost of uh, dedicating space to applications. So that's the opposite of sharing. Uh, can we get the benefits of both? And the idea is to design shared resources such that they are efficiently utilized, uh, they're controllable and partitionable. And therefore, when, when we do that, we won't have wasted resources and we will have uh, quality of service mechanisms for uh, threads, basically. And the memory system uh, that, is, that you see in this red highlighted region is a major shared resource. We keep adding more and more uh, components to our systems, but the memory uh, is shared by all of those components. And the, the, the threads in these cores in this picture, for example, interfere, their requests interfere in the memory system. And this will, uh, this will become a much, much more of a shared resource in the future in the sense that memory will occupy more and more of our chips. It's already, doing, it's already occupying more and more area in our chips and becoming more of a, um, essentially a shared resource in the future. Okay, so let's look at inter uh, interference between threads and, or applications. So the problem here is threads share the memory system, but the memory system does not distinguish between uh, thread requests, right? We have seen some scheduling algorithms, for example, they don't care about uh, thread IDs, which, request, which thread the request is coming from is not important to them. And existing memory systems are free for all. Uh, they're shared based on demand. And the, the algorithms we have, like FRFCFS, they're not thread aware. They don't know what a thread is. And this causes a problem. Aggressive threads, we will see in the next slide, can deny service to other threads. And the systems we have don't try to reduce uh, or control inter-thread interference. So this is one example. Uh, we see unfair slowdowns due to interference in the slide. On the y-axis, we have the slowdown. On the x-axis, we have two different applications run in the same system in different cores. In core one, we execute a MATLAB program. In core two, we're executing GCC to compile something. And the bars represent the slowdown these applications suffer from compared to when they're run alone in the same system. The slowdown is disproportionate, right? This is a problem. Um, you don't expect one workload to be slowed down significantly more than the other workload. They should, slow, they should have similar slowdowns if they're fair to them. Now, why does this happen? So this is, again, a picture of a shared memory system with the cores that we run two applications on. So on core one, uh, we will run a streaming workload. This workload accesses consecutive cache lines uh, back to back. This is very memory intensive, so it keeps scheduling requests to main memory through the memory controller. And the other one is a random access workload. This is also very memory intensive, but it's not streaming, right? It just accesses random locations in main memory. So they, uh, the key idea, uh, well, the key thing here is they have different access patterns, these two workloads. Uh, the relevance of this to the previous slide is basically stream represents the MATLAB workload here, and GCC represents more like the random workload. Now, the requests arrive in the memory controller. What happens? The streaming workload is prioritized by, by the thread unaware memory controller because, uh, well, because I will explain it more in the next slides, but the key idea is it has a lot of row hits, right? Compared to random, stream has row hits only because it's just accessing the next cache line, next phase. All of them are row hits. So they get prioritized over randoms memory requests. And stream is just bullying random here. It's taking random by its hair and putting it down the toilet. So, and the memory controller, our teacher, doesn't care. OK, and this goes on. OK, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this in a bit more detail. The streaming workload, as you can see, it just accesses uh, cache lines in close vicinity. It results in a lot of row hits. And the random workloads accesses random indices. So this has a very low row buffer hit rate, 3%, whereas streaming has 96% hit rate. 
And what does the memory hog or the bully do? So we have, again, a simulation of the memory requests that arrive in the buffer and how the scheduler uh, performs. This is the FRFCFS scheduler, right? It schedules streams request to row zero. And T1, thread one, random access thread, also injects a request to row 16. But before that can be serviced, there's another request from uh, T0 to row zero again. It's a different column. Now, what will the controller choose to do? It will schedule T0 because it's a row hit. And then we will have another request injected, but at the same time, a request from T0 comes again. It gets prioritized because it's a row hit. The story goes on, and we just keep scheduling row, uh, T0's requests, and T1 gets starved. This is, this is um, basically, this explains the uh, unfair slowdown on random. Yeah, this will go on. OK, yeah, another point. This uh, process continues until uh, T0 ex uh, exhausts the row buffer. In this case, it's 8 kilobyte large. And each request is 64 bytes large. That's 512 bits a cache line. And we have to schedule 128 of those because we can schedule, before we can schedule a request from T1. OK, any questions so far? No? Zoom? YouTube? No? OK. Cool. Uh, why? Because. We have the FRFCFS policy. It's thread unaware. It doesn't care about slowdowns. It just prioritizes the row hits. It doesn't even know it's unfair. Yeah, it's it. But basically, it maximizes DRAM throughput. It's still, it's still maximizing DRAM throughput. But uh, in in one sense, it's maximizing performance. But what happens is now the random, the the core that's executing random is not making any progress. That's where the uh, system. Um, performance degradation comes from also. We're causing starvation in one core. Uh, these are different combinations of workloads executed in a real system. So stream gets slow down, some slowdown, random gets a lot more slowdown. And you can have stream in one case. So this is the memory. This is the bully. When you put something next to the bully other than the bully, they will get a lot of unfair slowdown, basically. And this problem versions with more cores. Uh, lib quantum is more of a streaming workload here, as you can imagine. And the other workloads that are executing on other cores get unfair slowdowns. Now, this, is, this system is vulnerable to denial of service. It cannot, uh, it cannot enforce priorities or system level agreements, and also has low overall system performance. While one core executes as fast as possible, perhaps just slow down a bit, the other cores are not doing anything meaningful. So we're losing on system throughput. And it's an uncontrollable, unpredictable system. And yeah, you can see more combinations of workloads here. Uh, well, that's pretty much it for that specific problem. Well, pro the problem's manifestation in a multi-core system, right, in a shared main memory. but. Uh, you can do distributed denial of service, something similar in network multi-core systems as well. It's also very important. Uh, in these systems, we have cores connected via packet-switched routers on chips. So this is a diagram. All of these are different cores in the system. They're all connected some, some way to each other. Uh, and they all have shared resources. So one core on the lower top, uh, sorry, uh, top left side of this diagram can access the bottom right core's shared caches. Uh, and this is what an attacker is interested in doing. So the attacker here takes control of all eight cores that you see that's very far away from that bottom, bottom most, rightmost core. And they, they, they run a workload such that it keeps accessing that one core's shared memory. And in the system, we're running a stock option pricing application, black calls, in the other cores. Now, the important thing here is the stock option pricing application expects very low latency uh, access to, to main memory, essentially. 
And what happens when we do this? We essentially start the stock option pricing application from accessing uh, the, the interconnect and thereby accessing a large portion of main memory. And what we see is the latency increases by 5,000 folds. And this application no longer works. Or I don't know uh, how exactly this works, but imagine you, you want to buy a stock. And you, I mean, normally you would maybe wait for a second for this to work. Now you're waiting for 5,000 seconds. That doesn't make sense. The price changed a lot already. Right? And you can imagine the scale is much more, uh, much higher, and much larger in this case, compared to the example I tried to describe. Uh, these are the two papers. The first one is about the memory performance attacks where we had the streaming bully. Uh, this describes that attack. And this paper describes the, the other problem, the Black Skulls uh, stock option pricing uh, problem, <laughs> essentially. You can imagine the lack of QIS, uh, quality of service, as a safety and a security problem, right? Uh, this is Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, you have seen this multiple times in the, in the lecture, I suppose. And why is it a why can it be a safety and a security problem? Imagine you have a security critical application, and it just cannot do what it's supposed to do. You, you've started it out of all computational resources. That's how it can become essentially a security or a safety problem. Now, how do we solve this problem? Um, the interference between threads is not controlled uh, in all memory sources. Resources, the, the, those are the interconnects, memory controller, and caches. And we need to control this interference by designing an interface-aware or quality of service-aware memory system. Now, how do we develop those system? Uh, that system, we have to answer these questions. Uh, but I'll skip them because uh, we will touch up on all of those in more detail. Uh, there are two main methods to go with this, to design QoS aware or quality of service aware memory system. The first one is where you have smart resources that, uh, that have a configurable interference control or reduction mechanism, but you have to have them everywhere. Uh, you have to have QoS aware memory controllers, interconnects and caches. If you don't have one of them and the others, it, you cannot guarantee that you will be uh, providing quality of service. Or you can have DOM resources. Uh, you keep each resource as they are, but you reduce or control interference by, uh, by controlling injection, mem memory request injection, for example, to the system or data mapping. Uh, that can be in the form of source throttling to uh, control accesses to the memory system. The, how, how many requests this source can inject to the memory system, basically. You can have quality of service aware data mapping to uh, memory controllers, you can you can map one application to one controller, another to another con controller. Or you can have quality of service aware thread scheduling to cores. You don't want threads that interfere with each other in their caches, for example, in the same uh, in the same core, or in nearby cores where you have many core systems. You have to you want to uh, reduce contention and share resources basically. So we'll look at the first class, uh, uh, quality of service aware memory controllers in more detail. But let me see. Uh, yeah, let's continue. So I'll take a break in five, 10 minutes. Yeah, so, okay. So how do we control interference or reduce interference? Uh, by prioritizing or scheduling requests properly, uh, by mapping data to different channels, banks or racks, so that we re reduce contention. We can uh, throttle a core or uh, other sources that can inject memory requests, right? The hardware accelerators, GPUs. Or uh, we can schedule applications or threads in a more quality of service aware way. Now let's look at prioritization a bit, but I'll flash some lecture videos, uh, recordings here. So Professor Mutlu talks about these in more detail. And, Previous editions of this course, uh, you can find the videos here. Now, memory channel partitioning is an interesting uh, thing. Uh, and you can basically find more details about it in this video. Uh, this is something I want to mention before we take the break. Uh, we won't go into too much detail, but there's, this paper deals with 
CPU and input output interference. Uh, the problem here is we have cores that access main memory, but we have also IO agents in our system, like the, the direct memory access the agents or hardware units that perform direct memory access. They share the same memory. And this paper develops a new DRAM chip essentially that uh, that that allows those I/O agents and the CPU to not interfere with each other when they access main memory. Uh, it's it's a nice read. It's an interesting problem, and if you're interested also in this, you can take a look at it. So we will dive deeper into some quality of service aware memory scheduling techniques. These are still relevant to the memory controller design. It's an important problem, but uh, I will take a break until past 15. It's like 11 minutes. No, wait, that's more than 11 minutes. But we can take it, yeah. So we'll continue at past 15. Do you have any questions? No? Okay. Let's meet again at past 15. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
Okay, it's past 15. So let's continue with some quality of service aware memory scheduling techniques. Uh, we'll start with a brief, brief like overview of the evolution of these techniques. So I'll flash a bunch of papers and ideas to you. And I'll try to briefly go over them at first, the key ideas and their key takeaways. And then later we will go into each one of them in more detail. And hopefully you will find it fruitful. So this is again our depiction of our memory system. 
and the controller resolves memory contention by scheduling requests. Uh, now, how do we schedule requests to provide not only high system performance, like those basic scheduling techniques that we've seen do, but also high fairness to applications and configurability to system software? So the short answer is memory controllers need to be aware of threads. Now, there are a bunch of quality of service aware memory scheduling techniques that our group in the past have worked on and many other research groups also have worked on. So I'll highlight some of these works. The first one is, and we'll go into details about these three uh, papers today, and the rest I think will follow in the next lecture. So the first one is stall time fair memory scheduling. This, you have seen the unbalanced slowdowns in the previous, uh, uh, previous part of the lecture in, in random and stream, right? And the first technique basically estimates the slowdown each thread would uh, uh, basically um, basically receive and prioritize the thread that would otherwise slow down more, uh, more unfairly. So the idea is to prioritize that request that will slow down more and thereby uh, ensure system fairness. The takeaway is proportional thread progress improves performance, especially when the threads are memory intensive. Next one is parallelism aware batch scheduling. This is more of a performance oriented uh, technique. So we this work observes that um, threads, but this is also quality of service aware, but basically this work observes that when you use current scheduling techniques and you have multiple requesters, multiple threads, uh, you will have a situation where you cannot exploit bank level parallelism uh, for you cannot exploit bank level parallelism optimally for the set of requests that you have. We will go into details of that. And the takeaway is basically if you preserve this within thread bank level parallelism, it improves system performance. And you can also perform, uh, you can also improve fairness uh, on top of uh, you know, QoS unaware memory scheduling technique uh, by batching these threads. But yeah, details will follow. The Atlas memory scheduler uh, developed after these. Two, it prioritizes threads that have attained the least service uh, from the memory scheduler. This will become more relevant when we talk about the first two papers. Uh, the takeaway here is that you prioritize light threads, light in the sense that they are not memory intensive, and you see performance benefits. There are many other works that I won't go into details today, such as thread cluster memory scheduling integrated memory channel partitioning and scheduling. This integrated memory channel partitioning and scheduling we won't cover in this uh, lecture, in the next lecture as well, but uh, I referred you to a video. Uh, so please check it out if you're interested. And there are more uh, QoS aware memory scheduling techniques, parallel application memory scheduling, uh, stage memory scheduling, and memory slowdown model, uh, MISE. This is building on top of prior work, obviously, but it estimates the performance of threads when they're, um, when they're run alone in a system while they're running along with more cores in the system. So this is a difficult uh, feat to achieve, and this paper deals with that nicely. And then there's also ASM developed on top of MIAC, and then this is a, at a high level, it extends MIAC to account for cache and memory interference. And the takeaway is you can approximate uh, application performance. You can estimate application, application performance by uh, looking at cache access rates. We will go into details of these, so these are just an overview. There's Bliss, blacklisting memory scheduler, basically deprioritizes a thread if it thinks that thread has consecutively serviced, well, not thinks, but when it learns that the thread has consecutively serviced a large number of requests. This will allow uh, us to prioritize indirectly, right, the threads that don't get served that often. And there's dash deadline aware memory scheduler. This is in the context where you have multiple, again, agents in a heterogeneous system, CPUs, GPUs, hardware accelerators, and hardware accelerators with deadlines. Uh, this technique is trying to improve service quality for those while not, um, while sacrificing performance. There are other techniques that are Prefetch aware, 
So the key idea here is that if, even if you have a successful prefetch request, that means that it's the, the, the thing you prefetched are useful, uh, you can still uh, degrade system performance. And this work tries to identify those and prioritize prefetch requests according to how, uh, according to if, if, they, if they will degrade performance or not. And then this, these are interesting. So DRAM aware last level cache policies and write scheduling. I've talked about writes quite for, for quite a long while in the, in the first part of the lecture. Basically, this designs a cache eviction and replacement policy such that uh, you proactively uh, exploit the state of the memory controller in DRAM. This means you uh, proactively evict cache lines from your last level cache when you know that the DRAM row that you're going to write to is already open. OK, and then there is a quality of service aware memory scheduling techniques in context of other memory technologies like NVM. Here, uh, we want to carefully handle the write and read prioritization with coarse grained batching and application aware scheduling. Basically, write requests uh, for NVM is important when you have persistent memory applications that write to, that very intensively write at certain intervals to memory. And this interferes with other memory requests for, from other applications. And there's a way to deal with them very intelligently in this paper. Improves performance in cases where we have those persistent and non-persistent applications running in NVM systems. There is uh, scheduling techniques for GPUs. And there is also worst case executing time based memory scheduling for real time. System. These are all quality of service aware scheduling techniques in different contexts. Now we'll go on with uh, STFM, stall time, fair memory scheduling. Uh, this is the first paper we will cover in quality of service aware memory scheduling techniques. And the problem you're uh, aware of this already, you're familiar with it. This leap quantum bully bullies others into losing performance unproportionally, and the system is vulnerable to denial of service. And we don't want this. This is uncontrollable and unpredictable. So what do we do? Uh, we develop a new scheduling technique with the goal of sharing, basically threads, sharing main memory, should experience similar slowdowns. That's the obvious thing. Basically, that's the obvious goal to satisfy if you want fairness. Uh, and we also improve overall system performance by making sure those cores that otherwise would not make progress now actually make progress, right? And the idea is that the memory controller estimates uh, the slowdowns of each thread and schedules the requests in a way that balances these uh, slowdowns between threads. That's the paper. And basically, a DRAM system is fair if it equalizes the slowdown of equal priority threads. Uh, relative to when each thread is run alone on the same system. So this paper develops a mechanism that estimates the slowdown of, of a VRAM-related slowdown of a thread when it's uh, run alone in the same system. Because we already know this. Basically, if we can estimate that, we can, we know, uh, we, we can also know what's the slowdown currently, right? So be, basically, this is describing how we uh, measure that. So memory slowdown is a function of uh, the DRAM related stall time of the thread when it runs with other threads and DRAM related stall time of the thread when it's run alone. Now, when you have a system that's running these threads at the same time in a shared system, you don't know what the slowdown would be if it was run if it if the thread ran alone, right? Uh, the the way that they compute this is quite detailed, like quite complex, so I won't go into those details. Uh, but the mechanism in the end aims to equalize memory slowdown for interfering threads without sacrificing performance. And yeah, the two things it considers, along with other things that I won't cover, is inherent DRAM performance of each thread, and it aims to allow proportional progress of threads. But I will have you know a simulation of how this works. Uh, the algorithm looks like this. So for each thread, uh, the controller tracks these two metrics, the slowdown when it's run alone and the slowdown when, it's, when, it, when, it's, when the thread is run shared. In each cycle, it will compute a slowdown for threads with legal requests, requests in, in the request buffer. And it computes unfairness as the maximum slowdown 
encountered by any of the threads, uh, sorry, like receive, any thread receives, and the minimum slowdown. And if unfairness is smaller than a met, basically a threshold that we determine, we will use the DRAM throughput oriented scheduling technology that's just FRFCFS uh, because we deem the system to not be unfair. So the system is fair, so we can just use the throughput oriented scheduling pulse. If unfairness is greater than that threshold, uh, we use a fairness oriented scheduling policy that request uh, that schedules the requests from the thread with the maximum slowdown first. And then row hit first and then all this first. Basically, we add another a condition to our FRFCFS scheduling policy. So how does it prevent unfairness in this memory hog example? Here you can see uh, the same simulation in the previous slides. And we have two, uh, we have three other state here, basically T0 slowdown, thread zero slowdown, thread one slowdown, and the unfairness metric that we calculate. And our threshold is 1.05. So if unfairness is larger than 1.05, we will prioritize the maximum slowdown thread. So we schedule the request of the first thread, and then we schedule uh, the second request from thread zero. Now we update the slowdown value, because if this was run alone in the system, it wouldn't encounter the slowdown due to us scheduling T0's requests. Uh, and then we continue executing this uh, workload, right? We schedule T0's threads, uh, T0's requests. And at some point, the unfairness uh, exceeds the threshold. Once it does, we start prioritizing the maximum slowdown thread. And doing that will basically schedule T1's request here. That will reduce, uh, that, will, that will increase T0's slowdown. Right? And unfairness is a, is a function of these two. So unfairness reduced because both of them now have some slowdown. That's sort of pro proportional. That's be below the threshold value. And now we go back, fall back to the FRFCFS policy. And once the unfairness again exceeds the, our threshold, we will prioritize the random workloads or T1's requests in this case. This is how we prevent unfairness using stall, uh, sorry, STFM. And the benefits of this is it's the first algorithm specialized for fair uh, multi-core memory scheduling. So there was no solution to this problem before that. Uh, and it provides a mechanism to estimate memory slowdown of a thread. Now I didn't go into details of that mechanism, uh, but it has some disadvantages also. I'll touch upon those. It's good at providing fairness, as you can see, uh, as you saw from the previous slide, and it being fair can also improve performance in some cases. Now, downside is do does not handle all types of interference, and that will be more clear in the next paper. It's complex to implement. The uh, well, in in two in two ways. First, we have to uh, measure a lot of uh, statistics, basically, in the memory controller. And we have to do integer division, which is kind of complex, a kind of complex operation to implement. And slowdown estimations here can be incorrect. Uh, yeah, so there's more, more details in this paper. If you're interested, you can read it. Uh, as I said, I didn't go into details about how the authors um, actually perform, uh, actually estimate the slowdowns in much detail. It might be good to check. Next one is, uh, do you have any questions? Okay. The next one is parallelism aware batch scheduling. So here, uh, there's another problem due to memory interference, but it manifests in a different way. Uh, this is relating to that weakness of the prior work that doesn't handle all sorts of interference. Like this is a new sort of interference. The uh, processes try to tolerate memory latency by generating multiple outstanding requests. Uh, and we're trying to exploit memory level parallelism here. We have many components in our systems that, uh, that exploit this out of order execution, non-blocking caches, uh, and run ahead execution, for example. This is effective only if the DRAM controller actually services the multiple requests in parallel in, the, in different DRAM banks. Now, when you have multiple threads that share the same DRAM controller, 
uh, DRAM and the DRAM controller is not aware of threads uh, or of a thread's um, memory level parallelism, it can unknowingly service each thread's outstanding request serially instead of in parallel. This will become more clear in this simulation. So this is what we have uh, when we execute the workload alone in, in, in the system. Thread A will do some, some computation, and at some point, it will issue two DRAM requests, uh, one to bank 0, row 1, and the other one goes to bank 1, row 1. So we can exploit bank-level parallelism here, right? And that's what we'll do. We'll schedule the request to bank 0, and immediately after, just after a slight delay that we, you know, that we have because of timing parameters, uh, we schedule the second request. The core stalls for some time, and when both requests return, the core can do meaningful compute again. Now, what happens basically here is the bank access latency of two requests is almost the same as the access latency of one request, it's just a little bit more because of that additional timing parameter. Uh, what happens when we have two workloads that have the same characteristics? Uh, they, they will do some compute, then they will gen each generate two DRAM requests to two different banks uh, to do it different roles also. That's not the important part. Uh, our thread unaware controller or scheduler, what does it do? It services the requests in um, firstly the first come first store order. There's nothing ready, so we're prioritizing the oldest request, which is thread A's request to bank zero. We schedule that. And now we have to schedule the next oldest request, the younger request, which is thread B's access to bank one. Now, both requests are scheduled. And what happens then is we go to the next request of thread B to bank zero. We schedule that to bank zero. And we schedule thread A's request to bank one. Uh, the total stall time here, as you can see, is almost two bank access latencies. But there was a, was there a better scheduling order? Yes. Uh, if we have a parallelism aware schedule, if, if we have a schedule that knows about thread IDs or which request is coming from which thread, it could schedule them like this. It would prioritize, once it schedules the first request, it will prioritize thread A's request to the other bank. Right? In this way, thread A stalls only for one bank access, almost one bank access latency, as you can see in, yeah, very soon, yes, here. So thread A can continue computing at this point. Thread B suffers from addition, not additional latency, right? This is, the, this is the latency it suffered from in the original case when it was run alone. Uh, sorry, when it was run along with A, with a, in, a, in a system where we don't have a thread aware memory scheduler. So in doing so, we reduced the total stall time for thread A by, well, significantly. Uh, and the average stall time for both threads is 1.5 bank access latency. So we increase system throughput, hopefully. Now, how do we uh, enable this? So we have two principles in our schedule. First is parallelism awareness. So it schedules requests from a thread back to back. This is done to exploit bank level parallelism. And the problem with this, it can cause starvation. If we keep only uh, prioritizing the same thread, right? We won't serve other threads also. So that's, that's a fairness problem. The, how do we solve that? It's by request batching. So we group a fixed number of oldest requests from each thread to, into a batch. And the idea is to service the batch before all other requests. There might be hundreds of, let's say, I'm exaggerating here. Let's say we have 1,000 requests in the memory request buffer. Uh, by batching, we essentially prioritize, let's say, 50 of those requests over the rest of the 950 requests. And doing so, because, we, because uh, the same number of requests from each thread contribute to the batch, uh, we, essentially, um, we essentially are fair to, to, the, to the requests in the, to, to, to each thread at the batch level. Inside the batch level, we have other optimizations that I'll talk about that will provide fairness. OK. Uh, so here, 
is depicting it's it's depicting how batches are formed, right? So we have multiple requests in a batch from each thread, and we service them first in this order. Ideally, I didn't show you how we do this yet, but as you can see, we're scheduling T0's requests first so that T0 can continue computing, and then T1 uh, in some order, right? And then T2. So the average stall time is reduced. Now, once we're done with this batch, we move on to the next batch. And we never uh, prioritize requests that are not in the batch. So it has two components. The first one is request batching. And then the second component is within batch scheduling. Uh, request batching basically works by uh, assigning a bit to every memory request. So is, is, it, is it in the batch or not in the batch? It's just one bit to indicate that. Uh, we mark up to marking cap all this request per bank for each thread and mark requests make up the ba uh, batch and we form a new batch when there are no marked requests are left and we prioritize these requests over non-marked marked ones uh, and there's no reordering of requests across batches so this will allow uh, for no starvation and basically it will improve fairness but how do we re prioritize requests within a batch we can use, we could use existing uh, scheduling policies like FRFCFS that exploits row buffer locality, but uh, we also want to preserve inter thread bank level parallelism. Right? We want to service each thread's requests first before we move on to the next thread's requests. So, how do we do that? We do that by uh, computing a ranking of threads when the batch is formed. Uh, ranking essentially is we assign a number to each thread, right? We rank them. And the higher ranked threads are prioritized over lower ranked ones. Uh, this will improve the likelihood that requests are in, uh, from a thread are serviced in parallel by different banks. And different threads are prioritized in, prioritized in the same order across all banks. Uh, but to understand this is enough to look at what happens just inside the bank. And that's what we'll do. So how do we compute the ranking of threads? Uh, the basic idea here is I'll show you first a case where we don't reorder, uh, well, rank threads. These are the red, red requests are from thread B and blue requests are from thread A. This looks like the case in the earlier slides. Basically, if you look at how, uh, in what order these requests are serviced, you'll see that thread A and thread B waits for the same amount of uh, that long time. And the key idea is if we rank them so that uh, the requests are executed in the order that we rank them, the, and we look at the timeline again, we see that thread A waits for less time than it used to in the non-ranked uh, version. Uh, and we save cycles. This is the benefit of ranking. Now, how do we do that? Uh, we want to maximize system throughput. So we want to minimize average stall time of threads uh, within the batch. And we want to minimize unfairness here also. So we want to equalize the slowdown of threads. And the insight, the key insight is, if you de delay memory non-intensive threads, uh, it results in high slowdown. So this is a, a thread that's very compute intensive, that doesn't, that doesn't really uh, have very high memory pressure. So it computes a lot then just sends a memory request, waits for it to be able to do meaningful compute again. So it's better to serve that right ahead, right? And there are not much requests from that thread to serve also. But if we delay that, we induce a very high slowdown. So this is what we try to optimize. We have a shortest stall time first ranking here that uh, provides optimal system throughput. Uh, I think that was demonstrated by this paper from uh, Wayne Smith, 1956. And the controller basically estimates each thread's stall time within the batch. And we will rank threads with shorter stall time. Uh, basically, we will rank threads from shortest stall time to highest stall time. Now, how do we uh, estimate the stall time? We use two metrics. The first one is the maximum number of marked requests to any bank. That is, number of batched requests to any bank. And we'll pictorially describe that very soon. And this is called max bank load. Uh, 
you want to rank threads with lower uh, max bank load, higher, because a lower max bank load indicates that the thread is not so memory intensive. So we shouldn't delay those requests. And then we also count the number of total marked requests. And this is called total load. We use this to break ties in case there are threads that are ranked, that are ranked the same when we use only the max bank load uh, metric. So here are a bunch of requests to four different banks from different threads. And this is how we compute the uh, table that we need to rank threads, right? The well, T0 has a max bank load of one because to each bank, it schedules only one request at most and a total load of three. T1 has a max bank load of two because it schedules two requests to bank zero and a total load of four because it has four requests. And you can see how we, I mean, we compute the same things for T2 and T3 similarly. Now, the ranking is determined from top to bottom here, right? Because max bank, we order from lowest max bank load first. And then to break ties, we use total load. So ranking is like this. Now, we will prioritize the request in this order also. So how does it affect the scheduling orders, this ranking? So this is uh, how, we, how we execute, basically how we issue these requests in case we don't have uh, the ranking implemented. And we'll see how much each core stalls. So T0 st stalls for uh, four units of time, right? Uh, basically, this is, uh, this is also a timeline of uh, requests that are issued at the same time. So any, any request that's at this level in time, they're, they're scheduled at the same time. Any requests here, they're scheduled at the same time. This is why T0 has a stall time of uh, four, basically, because the, lo the last requests are executed in un time unit four. And T1 has five, uh, no, uh, T1 has four, uh, T2 has five, T3 has seven. Uh, what happens when we use the ranking that we have? So the average uh, access latency is five here. We just average the four numbers. So part B is scheduling order looks like this. We apply this ranking. So we execute T0's request first, but there's a place left to execute T1's requests in bank zero also, right? So we do that. We fill in that gap with T1's requests. And uh, the stall time for T0 here is one because we executed all of its requests in the first uh, unit of time. T2's, uh, sorry, T1's uh, stall time is two. T2's stall time is four. And finally, T3 has seven. Now, the average bank access latency reduced significantly. And the maximum bank access latency didn't increase at all. Right? This is uh, basically this is benefiting from the uh, longest uh, stall time first approach. So putting it together, Part BS scheduling policy is made up of four components. First, we schedule the marked requests that's in the batch, then row hit requests because they can be serviced very fast. If you if you have a row hit, it's done in two nanoseconds. You're done. Uh, third, higher rank thread first in case we have uh, conflicts, row conflicts, or row misses, uh, using the shortest stall time first algorithm and then the oldest requests first. So the first component here is due to batching and the last three makes up parallelism aware within batch scheduling, right? There are three pro properties of the scheduling mechanism. First, it exploits row buffer locality, uh, as you can see, because it's the second, second thing we'll look at is row hits first, and intra-thread bank parallelism by ranking threads. It's worth conserving so Unmarked requests that target a bank that's not targeted by any marked requests can also proceed. I didn't cover that in the slides, but it, it makes sure to utilize resources in cases where it looks as if it cannot. Uh, and then marking cap is important. Basically, if you have a too small cap, that means you're taking too few requests from each thread with, to a batch at the same time. That means you cannot really look at um, 
a long history of requests that you can schedule in parallel to different banks from each thread. So you're not exploiting bank level parallelism in that case. If you have a too large of a cap and there are, um, yeah, the too large cap, the problem with that is the requests or the threads that we wanted to prioritize produce very few amount of requests, right? So you can imagine they will, uh, um, they will contribute only a few requests to each batch. But if we set the cap too large, that means we're bringing in too many requests from those threads that, uh, that are memory intensive. And that what that will do is the next request that this poor thread generated will fall out of the batch. And it will take a long time for us to be able to serve that request. It will in increase the latency we imposed on that uh, poor thread. There are many more trade-offs analyzed in the paper, and it's also not so costly. Um, it requires 1.5 kilobyte storage in, in on-chip storage uh, for an eight-core system with a 128 entry memory request buffer. Doesn't do complex operations like division, doesn't need that. It's not on the critical path. The others evaluated the uh, circuit latency and found that uh, the scheduler can make decisions uh, every DRAM cycle. Uh, they evaluated the performance, and this here we're plotting the unfairness metric. This is the max memory slowdown divided by min memory slowdown. It's from the uh, paper I presented before, the same metric. Uh, so the lower we have on the y-axis here is better or more fair. In this case, par BS is fair. Uh, it, it's actually the most fair on average across all workloads they executed for all cores uh, for all core configurations. <laughs> And also provides better system speed up, right? Because we can now exploit bank level parallelism inside the thread. We improve performance over STFM, uh, even when we compare to STFM, basically. Now, the benefits of this approach is uh, it's the first scheduler to address bank level parallelism destruction across multiple threads. That's the problem we introduced in the first slide. And it's a simple mechanism compared to STFM, simple in the sense that it's very easy compared to STFM to implement. And batching, all, so this is not just improving performance, right? It's also improving fairness. And we have seen that in the results also. Um, and the ranking system enables parallelism awareness. So we, ranking, we, uh, we can parallelize requests from the same thread to different banks. Now, the downside is it does not always prioritize the latency sensitive applications. This will become more apparent in the next paper. And that's parallelism of very bad scheduling. Yeah, if you're interested in this paper, please go ahead and take a look. It was one of the 12 computer architecture papers of 2008, selected as top mix, pot top picks, sorry, by my, IEEE Micro. And uh, this is the Micro Topics edition of the paper. Uh, we have ten more minutes, so I'll cover this scheduler also. This is very. This is gonna. This is not gonna take too much time, and then we will end the lecture there. Okay. Any questions so far? Good. Okay. So Atlas's goal uh, is a bit different. It's maximizing system performance, and the main idea is to prioritize the thread that has attained the least service from the memory controller or memory controllers in, in case where we have multiple of them. And uh, Atlas means adaptive per thread least attained service scheduling. So we rank threads based on the attained service in the past time intervals. So we'll inspect uh, requests in granularity of time intervals and look at how many of our requests per thread were, uh, were serviced. And we will enforce thread ranking in the memory scheduler uh, during the current interval. So we look at a in, uh, past interval, we'll rank the threads, and then we will enforce that ranking in the current interval. Why does it work? Because it prioritizes these light or memory non-intensive threads uh, that are more likely to keep their course busy. This is the same uh, observation insight we had in the previous paper. It's exploited to a greater extent here. Uh, it provides better system throughput than prior work in FRFCFS and FCFS in a 24 core system. Uh, and well, I see 
Well, yeah, it's in 24 core system and we have different number of memory controllers on the x-axis. So as the memory controller increases, our system throughput also increases with Atlas. And it consistently, consistently provides higher system throughput than all previous scheduling algorithms. And this is a four memory controller system and we scale the number of cores. As we increase the number of cores, Atlas's performance benefits here also increases. Now, uh, I didn't describe the mechanism at all, right? But I'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses and uh, we will uh, end the lecture there. So this is good at impro improving overall throughput because it, imp uh, it prioritizes compute intensive threads to a greater extent than ParBS does because ParBS is limited in what it can see inside a batch. This, uh, is, this has a more wider view of memory requests than ParBS. It's very low complexity and uh, it coordination among control multiple controllers. I didn't touch on this aspect a lot, but uh, happens infrequently. Uh, the weaknesses are the lowest or the medium rank threads get delayed significantly. So it's very unfair, uh, but it was not, this, it, its goal was not to improve fairness. So that's it for Atlas and that's it for this lecture actually. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, I can take them now or later. Next week, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna continue covering uh, quality of service aware memory scheduling techniques, starting with TCM. And we're going to cover quality of service in a bit you know, wider uh, context. We're gonna uh, just briefly go over um, other QoS aware components in our systems today, or that we should have in our systems today. So thank you. Yeah, we're done. Thanks. Thank you.